By our first guest tonight, the NHS GP, uh, Dr. Anshu Bhagat, who is here to talk about the new restrictions and COVID-19 testing. Welcome, Dr. Anshu. Welcome. Good evening. Fantastic. How Welcome. Listen, I I'm loving the rainbow behind you. Thank you. My children, uh, it's been there for quite a while now, but it's... Uh, I think it still stands uh, stands firm. Oh, it does indeed, and so 100%. it should. And so it should. Even at our house, the youngsters did their, you know, NHS, uh, you know, rainbows, and they put them up in the windows, and they're still there. Not, we're not taking those down. Fantastic. No, well, listen. Not yet. Uh, look, I mean, there's been a, quite a few announcements the last few days. I mean, Scotland has gone totally. I mean, I literally felt like listening to the first announcement when when COVID came in and the lockdown. I mean, how? extreme are the measures are they appropriate that are taking place around the country north england for example and some of the other localities that are being hit by covid a bit higher than everywhere else are we going the right way is it kind of mini lockdown is that the right way forward i think you know i'm, I'm in a unique position being in the nhs and the private sector and one of the things that we started seeing from the start of this and if we all sort of take our, our brains back to sort of february when things were sort of really on the rise at a, at a sort of aggressive scale. And mm. we can all reflect on what we should have done. Maybe we should have locked down a little bit sooner at the time and maybe we wouldn't have been in sort of, you know, had so many high cases with so many high deaths. So I think we've learned a lot in the last five, six months. It's been nonstop for all of us, really. Um, I think we have to now take this in a sort of locality level. So different parts of the country are clearly starting to, to, to accelerate at much different paces. So if we start to look at Scotland, if we start to look at the northeast, the northwest, Birmingham, the Midlands, um, the, the, the numbers per 100,000 population are far, far greater than, for example, London. So we're still holding fairly firm in the southeast at the moment. But, you know, we need to just make sure that where there are these spikes in, in, in cases, we need to definitely start to think slightly differently. Now, what happened back in February was that nobody really knew quite what was going on, but the number of cases were so aggressively high that really the whole country had to be in, in lockdown. Whereas I think we're now in a slightly different position where we can start to isolate local pockets um, and start make local regions sort of take control about what happens in that area. Thank you, Dr. Anshu. Um, you know, people are obviously going to be concerned. Naturally, they'll be worried. Uh, there's so many cases. It's, it's, it's quite unbelievable, actually. Um, these measures that are being spread across the country in different, you know, uh, different localities and what have you, do you really think they're going to be effective? Because we've heard so many things the previous time around, and it seems like it didn't really work. Um, I think we're fighting a battle. I think, you know, the lockdowns that happened first time, which was a national lockdown, and that mm. happened because, quite frankly, we were all a little bit scratching our heads at that point, going, crikey, what's going on? So the best way for us to kind of get a grip of it was let's shut everything down. And I think we've, sure. we've come some way since then. Um, look, I think, you know, some of this was expected. I, I, you, know, I, you know, we've been talking about second wave for, for, quite frankly, since the first wave. And, you know, so you know, if we look back in history, every hundred years we have a pandemic um, and we can start to see the second wave kicking in. And it always kicks in when lockdowns start to um, be loosened. Now, the reality is, is, look, we're all, you know, you know, emotional creatures as humans. And what we can't be, you know, it's, sort of, it's a balance between sort of public health and now, clearly, we're having these quite remarkable discussions about how do you how do you marry sort of public health and the safety of our of our public with mm. the economy? Mm. Um, and we're having these um, discussions about sort of people's jobs going, people not having income, livelihoods been destroyed. There's parts you know there's parts of the working sector which have completely been decimated. So. I think, you know, we underestimate the power of that and the long-term effects of that. And, I, you know, I think in the long term, we've got to make sure that absolutely we keep public health as a priority. But it has to be arguably maybe done with some idea on, on how this affects the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. But the, the bottom line is, is if numbers start going even higher than where we're talking today, then lockdowns and national lockdowns may be on the table. W would you say then that people, you know, in certain parts where lockdown is been put back in place, are they not taking heed or is it just the nature of the virus? It just happens to be a lot higher in Scotland or a lot higher. I, mean, I think Scotland, to be honest, I don't think it's a lot higher. I think Nicola is just pretty stringent on what, how she wants to do it. You know, I, I've been from Glasgow, so I know what she's like, <laughs> uh, which is not a bad thing, actually. So, you know, what is causing the higher numbers in certain localities? 
I think we, I think we, you know, opening up lockdown was inevitable that as people start to mingle again, and if we understand how this virus spreads, it spreads from people, from objects, you know. And so as public transport, for example, kicked off, um, it's interesting we're not seeing the cases in London yet with the underground, but as we start to see um, things like schools reopening, mm. um, you know, these were very predictable moments in our calendar. They happen every year. Um, schools were going to reopen. Universities were going to reopen. And we are starting to see businesses start to reopen as well, whether that be restaurants, the hospitality industry, hotels, travel again. So, you know, I think... We, this was expected. I think the reality is, is that we've got to uh, get a grip of this second wave. But going forward, we've got to understand what does um, controlling this virus look like? What does living with this virus look like? We know that our lives are not going to be the same pre-COVID. Um, going forward, we're going to be testing. We're going to be, even when we travel, we're going to be traveling in a different way. When we go to restaurants, we're going to be eating in a different way. Mm. So I think the reality is, is we've still got to be very careful, very sensible in, in what we're doing. Um, you know, one of the scariest things that I have experienced as a clinician is the increasing level of disbelief about the virus. It's really remarkable. You know, I, I'm, I'm coming across an increasing population now who say, um, and they come into my surgery and say, oh, doctor, you're not part of this uh, this fad as well, are you? And I start to think, gosh, that, you know, that, this, that, this belief that this virus is just a hoax I, I, really does exist. I'm listening to what you're saying in disbelief myself. I don't... I don't... Are there people still rising there? Is that well, really the case? That's what it is. You, you see a lot of them in central London protesting and what have you and, you know, giving people such bad advice. And then I they're mean, using those videos, sharing them on social media and spreading that ill message everywhere I mean, else. I know people personally that are going through COVID right now and, and they will tell you that it's the worst part, illness they've had in their life. Uh, I know people that passed away, sadly, uh, on the back of it. So I find that quite unbelievable. Look, just on a, on a, on a slightly lighter note, uh, there's that running joke, right? that uh, the virus at 10 o'clock, you're OK, but 10, you know, 10 or 1, you have to get home because it's going to be out. What, what, what is this? What is the point of this cut-off time? So I think what you're highlighting here is, is some of the confusion around the implementation of different policies, whether that be, um, you know, you've, you, you can't have more than six people in your house, whereas I can get on a plane with, with 100 people and that's fine, but I can't have six people in my house. Mm. Um, and then you can sort of you know, push that across to sort of different things that we're doing with shut the bars and restaurants at 10 p.m. I think th the strategy here is really trying to look at what other countries are doing who are slightly ahead of us. Um, so Europe, Spain, France, what they, they did um, certainly a few weeks back was implement the 10 p.m. cutoff. And the purpose of this was to encourage more civilised dining as opposed to sort of uh, groups of people going out drinking in in sort of groups and and you know whereas you know and that's the kind of thing we don't want you know what we don't want is groups of people um, and certainly um, you know a, a society started to open up it was probably a little bit more of a rebound where people really mm. did want to get out there and and start sort of mingling and that's the bit that I think is probably some of the strategy behind it but I appreciate mm. some of it is confusing and that's some of it doesn't I mean necessarily. Um, makes sense in, a, in, in, in that thing. So I think the, the bottom line on this is this is stage one. If we start to see um, cases go up even further, and remember, the more cases we see, the more people end up in hospital, and therefore the more people die. It's a simple equation. Um, and that's what we really want to prevent. And, you know, I think a lot of a lot of young people, you know, um, are going to be all right. You know, I don't want to sort of, you know, come across very sort of um, scare tactic here. Um, the reality is, is that young people will generally fare better. However, those young people go back into their own homes where mm. there are um, their parents, their grandparents, and that's the worry. That's mm. the worry. We do not want um, uh, our elderly population getting infected with this. And just on a specific note, you know, the BA BAME community, um, we suffer more. Um, oh, that's just yeah. a, a, a reality, you know, um, and there's lots of different things we can talk about why, you know, ranging from our own genetic background right the way through to that we, we live with our families. Sure. We are a family sure. orientated um, culture. So um, that's the kind of um, sort of thing we need to really be mindful of as well. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Ranshu, I'd like to touch on something that we're quite passionate about at Islam Channel, and that is looking after our mental health. Now, what do you think could be the effects of a six month lockdown on, on the mental health? And how can that we end prepare? Up in the year, won't it? Yeah, exactly. And, and how can our viewers, you know, kind of prepare and, you know, for something like that? 
You know, this is a really valid point, and I spend a lot of my time, and I've certainly spent a lot of my career um, uh, advocating uh, a, a, as an advocate for mental health and, and how do we start to improve it. I think COVID has been a real challenge, and I think not, you know, it's across the board, across all generations. Once we get told what we can't do, we start focusing on things that we can't do. And I can list you, and I'm sure you can as well, list 15 things that I'm really upset about that I can't do whether that be going to the gym, whether that be, uh, you know, all the different things that we, we, we're normally used to in society. What I'm telling my patients now is, is this is here to stay. And there's no two ways about it that this is going to affect people's mental health. But we've got two ways out of this. And one of the ways I'm, I'm really trying to push forward is we've got to come to terms. And this is um, a, an acceptance piece where we've got to agree that it's here to stay and we've got to start to change the way we think about it and think about the positives. I, have, I don't hear people talking about the positives of COVID mm -hmm. and the positives of this of 2020. Because, um, again, you know, I could list you 10 positives in my life that, uh, that I found. Yes, I could probably list you 20 negatives, but there's definitely 10 positives which we need to start to focus on. So this is a mindset where we have to accept that um, it's going to be tough. But we've got to understand that we've got to start seeing the brighter side of what's going on. It's, it's basically helped us to readdress the balance as well, I suppose. Yeah, Look, probably. I mean, I on, yeah. on the note of balance, I mean, you, you work for the NHS, you've also got private practice. How can the private sector and the NHS really work together, testing strategy and, and trying to eliminate what we're facing at the moment? Well, I think, look, the NHS is, 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 is a beacon of the world. And this is something that um, I wouldn't want to, quite frankly, live in any other country during a pandemic. Um, so I think we, you know, we should definitely be proud of ourselves in terms of what we have here, in terms of our health service. But there are going to be times such as pandemics where, where we can't cope. And we can see that with the testing numbers. You know, mm -hmm. we're just not getting tests out fast enough. Um, the, 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 what the WHO um, medical director um, advised, which was, if we want to get a grip of this disease, we need to test, test, test. Now, what we're doing at GPDQ Nationwide now is, is assisting in this program. We assist councils. We assist the NHS in terms of um, CCGs. Um, and we'll be shortly um, um, even assisting in, in sort of drive through testing. So we're here to help. And really, you know, I, I think the concept of, of the private sector shouldn't be a dirty word here. You know, we're really here to, to assist um, our country get where we need to get to. Doctor, you mentioned country and our country. And, you know, I want to just touch on something else in regards to, uh, you know, our neighbours and, and people from the other countries all over the world. Everyone has got different restrictions and they're, they're trying to combat or control this uh, spread of the pandemic. Now, people who have to travel or choose to travel, can you give us some advice on how they can stay a little bit safer? Absolutely. And I think you, we can all see the, the travel restrictions that were imposed. And that was really just no one's going anywhere. Now, where we are now is that, you know, people are traveling and countries have imposed their own individual entry requirements. Mm. So, you know, we're starting to see people needing to get um, PCR COVID swabs within a period of sort of uh, a time prior to your flight. And once you've had the swab, you have to self-isolate. And I think this is good practice. I think one of the frustrations I feel is that Nobody needs a swab to come into the United Kingdom. And I think we've got to reflect on this, really, and say, you know, whilst, we, yes, when we leave the country, we need swabs, and, and that's great, and those countries are doing these things, I think we've also get, you know, we've got to understand what is entering the UK. You know, because if we don't start to um, understand what's entering the UK and certainly put some restrictions around, restrictions meaning... You know, you should be getting swabs if you need to come into the United Kingdom. And I think, you know, these are the things that we've got to start to look for. Mm. I think in terms of travel, look, I think, you know, it still is arguably essential travel only. I think we'd all love to go on holiday and, 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 and relax. But I think at the moment, I would probably still say um, uh, it is essential travel. And if you do need to go and see family or, you know, for, for specific reasons, do so. But make sure that you get the swab. Make sure that you wear masks. You carry your alcohol hand gel uh, always wherever you go. Um, and keep your distance. You know, this is a social distancing exercise. And we really have to just make sure we try and adhere to that. I think the second part is making sure that people have the appropriate insurances before they travel. So they need to make sure that they're equipped to the country that you're going to. Make sure that the country that you're going to, that you're aware of their, how their medical facilities work. Um, so that should anything happen, you know what to do, you know where to go. Brilliant. Well, listen, to finish off with, you're a very positive bloke, right? 
Tell us something positive before we go. So let me tell you the positives that I find in, 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 in my life. So I, I run baby check clinics. Now, for the last 15 years, it's very rarely I see, um, I only see mothers and their babies at these, clinic, at these baby check clinics. And what I found really wonderful to see over the last six months is I'm now seeing dads at these as well. <laughs> and um, this has been a really wonderful time for new fathers to spend some quality time with their newborns. And, uh, uh, and you know, gosh, if I remember back, I, I, I didn't go to my child six week check you know my, my you know my wife took you know so i i think you know these are this has been a really sort of um, a humbling moment that i'm certainly seeing uh, in practice where uh, i get to see dads at these appointments which is fantastic fantastic Superb. well dr Anshu, thank you so much for your time and uh, god bless you and your family and keep safe pleasure thank you for Brilliant. thank we'll, you we'll speak soon thank Superb. you Live the life.